In this exercise we're going to be performing a very basic motion track uh, based on this footage that you can see uh, in front of you. I've left it running. So essentially we've got these uh, this this group of wildebeest walking horizontally across this plane and what I intend to do is the hilarious act of attaching a kind of speech bubble uh, to one of the wildebeest so it appears to be thinking as it's walking along. And I'm sure wildebeest do think as they're walking along. Um, but anyway, in this particular case um, we're going to be using something called a one-point feature track which essentially means that we're going to be tracking based on position but we're not going to take uh, particular account of things like motion, uh, rotation and scale properties. So the first thing we need to do, I'll just stop this, the first thing we need to do, this is of course assuming that you've already read your, uh, read your, your source image into the, uh, in, into the shot. I'm just going to move uh, to the first frame of the, of the image. The first thing that we need to do is we need to add a tracker node. Um, and we always connect that up to our uh, to the image that we're using as the source of the track. So I'll select that first and then tab and then just start to type until tracker appears. And once I've selected that you can see that the tracker node appears in the properties panel. So nothing happens initially and that's because we have to manually add tracks to this uh, to this tracker node. So let's see what happens when we press the add track. Okay, so you can see a couple of things. First of all, the a, a track now is populated into this area of the of the tracker node, and essentially we can add all we can add as many as we want of trackers into this into this particular area. In this particular exercise, we're only going to be uh, using one. Uh, other things that happen is that we get these overlays. We can see our our feature track box in the in the viewing area. And on this side we can see a preview area where, where we're actually looking at the contents of that feature box. So you'll see that as I, as I start to move this, and I move this by moving right into the center, and this might get tricky in the small area that I've got for the capture, um, moving right into the center of the feature and then just dragging down into position. And you can see that, the, uh, what's, you can see that, that's, uh, that it's changing within, the, uh, within that preview area. So I'm just kind of moving down here. I'm just going to put it between the uh, b between the horns of of this um, of the of this wildebeest here. The basic rules of um, of selecting a good a good place to track are relatively simple. Certainly, when we when we're working on a basic level like this, um, we're looking for areas of contrast where there's where there's obviously a differential between uh, bright areas and dark areas of the image. We can see we should get some contrast between the wildebeest and its background. We're looking for areas where the pixel data doesn't change that much over the course of the shot, uh, that it isn't affected particularly by light change or shadows or, or anything like that. We're looking for uh, areas that are affected minimally by things like motion blur. Uh, so essentially anything that kind of significantly changes the configuration of pixels within this viewing area over time we're looking to avoid. Now this wildebeest will be swinging its head so there'll be times when we'll only see uh, one uh, horn for example rather than the two that we can see in this particular pose uh, but hopefully we'll have enough information certainly for a basic uh, thing that we're trying to do now uh, to get something like uh, a track on this. So we've got, our, we've got our track in, we've got our pattern area in the middle sometimes called the feature region um, and essentially what's happening here is that is that Nuke will look for that pattern, that kind of pattern of pixels. It'll look for that pattern um, and it'll look for it on every frame based on this outer box which is the search area. So the essentially what the search area allows us to do, if I just note, point out that we can actually change the size of the pattern area so we can we can change that and obviously we can position it in, in different places uh, in order to get the best possible track. Uh, the search area is essenti is essentially means that Nuke will use this to determine it'll look for this uh, this pattern of pixels in the next frame based on based on the size of the search box. So if for example these wildebeest were sprinting across we would probably need to have this search box wider because the this pattern will have moved more with by the time it gets to the next frame. In this particular case, they're moving in a fairly ponderous way, so I don't necessarily need that to be wide. Uh, to be wide, I don't need it to have any kind of real vertical uh, ver vertical uh, extension at all. 
and the third and final part of this box is essentially the feature center itself so this is kind of like the the almost like the anchor point of the image if you like but in tracking terms so this is the center of the track so let's get tracking this and we'll see how we get on so we've got this uh, we've got this little menu which appeared here when we added our tracker um, or should I say when we added our tracker node and these are the basic controls which allow us to perform the track uh, there's a quite a quite a bit in here there's quite a bit of advanced stuff in here but we're going to be sticking to just a, a couple of uh, a couple of tools um, these which look suspicious like play buttons and that's essentially what they are but they these are the track forward and track back back buttons so this button here will track forwards um, and it will track forwards on, on a sort of an ongoing basis until it gets to the end of the shot this will do it on a frame by frame basis this allows us to stop the track and these are the mirror opposites so this move this allows us to track backwards one frame at a time and this allows us to track backwards for the for the full duration of the shot so we can track in either direction okay so we're going to start here by just setting it to track forwards and as we track it we're going to be watching this panel here because this is essentially our window to the accuracy and stability of the track so if we just set it going now You can see that we get a, a, a status going on here, and you can see how that's moved quite badly away from the uh, away from the, the horn. So effectively, if we just scrub through this, we can see that almost almost immediately this started to deviate, and then it lost its way. So this is actually serving, giving us nothing really in terms of uh, in terms of tracking quality. Um, and I'm glad that happened because it gives me the opportunity to show you what to do to address that. It means essentially we've got to recite our uh, our, our our tracking box, um, but we need to clear the data because you can see here this is animation data. If we look in the transform, we can see that we've got we've got active um, we've got we've got active active properties uh, in the in the in the transform. So we have keyframes. Uh, we need to get rid of those because they will interrupt any future tracks that we do based on this particular uh, particular track so this button here allows us to clear any tracking data which is beyond the current position of the playhead well the current position of the playhead is right at the beginning so if I hit this then it will clear anything beyond it in the uh, in, in that in this particular timeline so that essentially gives us the opportunity to start again so we'll come in here and we'll just make some we'll just try and refine this a little bit maybe I'll try and make it a little bit bigger and I'll just move maybe I'll move just to maybe between the ear and the horn and we'll try again based on that particular property so again we'll track forward and again as we do we're watching this with eagle eye so this is looking a lot better we're certainly following the head so it's not massively accurate. I wouldn't want to pin a, 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 a completely accurate roto, for example, to this. But in terms of attaching something like a speech bubble, we can see that it's following along. And if we just zoom out and take a look at the uh, at what's happening on the timeline, we can actually see the tracking data uh, displayed as a motion path. And we can see the nuances of this uh, of this motion path. Now we can see the uh, we can see that there's keyframes on every single frame. And we can see the sort of the, the the bobbing up and down of the head of the head movement there, and we can see sort of slight pace changes there. So we've got quite a lot of nuanced movement in there that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to accu accurately capture by manually keyframing uh, an element. So we have our data. So to use this. Um, to add uh, to add a second element, I need to bring a second element into my scene. Um, so I'll just bring in this element here, uh, which has inadvertently grabbed my viewer. Um, and this is a very simple graphic, which um, which I uh, created in Photoshop. So we're not doing anything uh, visually groundbreaking here. The principle is to get across the very basics of a uh, one-point track. So the first thing we need to do is hook these up. So again, I'm struggling a little bit within the within the capture area, uh, but essentially I need to add a merge node. So if I just select this and hit M, then that's going to connect it up to the A pipe, which is correct, and I need to put it into here to attach the B pipe. Okay, I'll 
just add a dot node just to sort of pull this out and give myself a little bit more space. In fact, what I'll do here is I'll just bring the viewer out and so that we're not sort of scratting around at the bottom here. I, I don't want to particularly uh, reduce the size of my uh, viewing area because uh, this is quite important for tracking purposes. Okay, so we've got a slight issue here. Uh, this, we can see that this is a Photoshop file that has uh, an RGB and an alpha channel, but we're not actually seeing that. We're seeing the uh, white. We're seeing a white overlay. We can see our black, our black arrow that we're using to kind of, that we're going to kind of pin to the uh, to the head of the uh, of the wildebeest, and we can see this hilarious "Are we there yet?" text. But obviously, we're not seeing our um, uh, our image below, even though we have merged it. So, and the the reason for this is because the image has got pre-multiplied alpha. So, in order to address this, we just need to add a pre mult node and once that's applied we should see the graphic now on uh, und uh, on top of the on top of our image it's not in the right position and it's not in the right scale yet we'll address that later but for now the first thing we need to do is we need to hook up our our transform data our tracking data should i say to uh, to the the position of of this um, of of this graphic and the way that we do this is to add a transform node to our graphic. So I'm just going to select the pre mult and hit T to uh, create a transform node. And this is something which came in in, I believe, Nuke 7, uh, a really cool, cool feature. Um, and it allows us to basically link properties from a transform node to tracking data that's within the same script. Uh, again, this might be tricky because of the uh, because of the the nature of the screen capture software. Uh, but the general principle here is that if we come to our translate data, remember that we've only tracked we've only tracked on the position. So if we just pull this out, you can see that we've only tracked the translation, the position of our element. We haven't tracked the rotation or scale. We've only used one tracking point, so we're only actually tracking the position. So for our transform close that. For our transform we only want to translate the position. So to do that what we do is we click on our animate menu and we choose we come down to link to. This is where I'm going off screen. What I'll do actually is I'll detach my transform node and bring it across because it's always going to sort of tile out to the right. So link to and this is where I can get at my tracker and I can come down here to my track one and choose that. And now these have gone these have gone blue which suggests that there is uh, that there's uh, animation data now applied to the transform node. So I'll just get rid of that so we can take a look. We can also see this little green line that's moving across uh, from the tracker to the transform node. This is a link that is now being explicitly created uh, by means of an expression. And that's what happened when we applied that link to operation. It's created an expression, a linked expression relationship between the tracking data in the no in the tracker node and the transform data on the graphic. So hopefully, what this means is, if I hit the play button now, then our graphic is now going along for the ride, and it has all that nuanced movement that we that we uh, got from our track applied onto our new graphic. Okay, how exciting is that? So the last thing that we need to do is we need to do something about the scale and the position of this uh, of this graphic uh, so that it's uh, proportional to the uh, to, to the to the uh, animals and also it's following our uh, our second wildebeest. So to do this, I'm just going to try and make myself a little bit of space in the node graph. Um, I need to put a tracker node before. Uh, a, a, sorry, a transform node into here, uh, which I'm going to apply, I c and I'm probably going to put two in here. Actually, um, I'll start by using one to scale the image down to something reasonable. Let's go for something like that, and then I'll add another one, and I'll use this to position the graphic. So if we play the image now. I'll just hit O to turn off my overlays. We can see my 
graphic moving along with my uh, with my second builder beast and we're starting to see the concern now being expressed by this particular builder beast you know it, the the water hole could be anywhere okay so that's the end of this exercise um, I should just say before before I wrap up that uh, that I've concatenated some transform nodes here you may have thought when I was actually sc scaling in this transform node well why not do everything in there why not <coughs> excuse me why not position why not scale why not why not change the anchor point what if we want to rotate why not rotate why not do it all in there well technically we could uh, but there is certainly an advantage with concatenating uh, tran transform nodes uh, because they will take their values from the uh, they'll take certain values from the from the transform node above um, and concatenate that onto the new transform nodes uh, we will look at that in more advanced tutorials but for now just accept that it is actually good practice to use several transform nodes to perform single operations rather than try to do too much within one okay that's the end of the exercise i hope you found that useful